the web is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Good portion of your page is HTML, and most of the web is pages. All right, makes sense to everybody? Everyone agree so far? Hands up. Good portion of you. Those of you who didn't put your hands up, we will have words. <laughs> you need the words and you need the pictures more than you necessarily need the design and more than you necessarily need the behavior. But that's why these things are in that order. You were hopefully taught HTML and then CSS and then JavaScript. Now, sometimes the JavaScript takes over a bit. Um, these things get larger. Um, and increasingly, we've started to see a world in which not just the JavaScript has become a bigger part of what we do as the web development, the tech community, but as something which becomes all that we do. You know, um, we've gone, we've come, we've arrived at a point where new entrants into our field, people learning the job that those of us who are developers are now doing, the first thing they're being taught is an NPM command, right? I'm not necessarily sure this is great. Let's think about an example. These things are meant to be in balance. That's why there are three different technologies. And the point about balance is that if things get out of balance, we end up with problems. So let's pick an example. So Zach Leatherman. Um, people heard of him? Built 11T, did loads of other stuff. Three cheers for Zach, he's a cool guy. Um, he built a page as a test, a performance test, um, testing a client-rendered React site which rendered a tweet against a plain HTML page which rendered a tweet in order to test which one was going to be fast. And I'm sure you could guess which one would... Oh, hang on. No, sorry, I read that wrong. He tested a site, a React site rendering a single tweet against a plain HTML page rendering all of his tweets, all 27,000 tweets, eight and a half megabytes of HTML. Um, Hannah, the sustainability thing, stick your fingers in your ears for a minute. <laughs> But he tested that, a page, with eight and a half megs of HTML rendering all of his tweets in plain HTML against a React site rendering one tweet, which was faster. <laughs> Anyone got a guess? Now, obviously, because I'm talking about this, you know what the answer is. And yeah, the answer is plain HTML by 200 milliseconds. Zach himself says, Lighthouse reports eight and a half megs of HTML wins. Another different example. So Remy Sharp. People heard of Remy Sharp, built JS bin, does ffconf, loads of other stuff. Nice guy. He was testing uh, syntax highlighting of code. So he's serving code on a web page, syntax highlighted in whichever language he was doing. And he was assessing two different ways of doing it. One of them, you do SSR, server-side rendering. It used to be just the web, but now it's got an acronym. And the idea behind that was he was rendering that to HTML on the server and then serving up the HTML with the syntax highlighting in it. And then the alternative approach is you serve the code and you serve a JavaScript library to highlight the code on the client side. And Remy actually says the single file HTML, the single HTML file, sorry, is larger with server side rendering. The total transfer size is 10K smaller. You serve all the code with all the styles baked into it, it's still smaller than serving the code and a JavaScript library to highlight the code. And there's practically zero impact on parsing time. Browsers are supernaturally quick at rendering HTML. They're really, really good at it. They've been optimizing this for years and years and years and years and years. It's tempting to outsource your work from your computer, your server, which you have to you know, pay for and run and make sure it doesn't fall over. It's tempting to outsource it to the world's largest distributed computer, which is the web, right? But that doesn't make the work go away. It just means everyone else does it instead of you. And more importantly, it means everyone else does it in duplicate. If I'm serving you code and play HTML, or worse, JSON, and then you're building it on the client side, then everyone who goes to that page is also doing that work. So back to the sustainability conversation that went on earlier, that doesn't seem that efficient. If you do it once, then it's done for everybody, and it's cached, and it's ready, and it's available. But 
Outsourcing to the world's largest distributed computer? Outsourcing to other people's computers? Not necessarily the best idea. You just say, you're just making everyone else do the work instead of you. And importantly, when you outsource to everyone else's computers, their computer is normally not as good as yours. Phones are mostly rubbish. Now, phones in this room, probably not. I've got an iPhone 13 that I bought a couple of months ago. It's great. It's really fast. Well, the Apple also, it's red. It's cool. But m shut up, it's cool. <laughs> but, but most people are not operating on this kind of device. If you look at, oh, Alex Russell. He says, the takeaway here is you literally can't afford desktop or iPhone levels of JavaScript if you're trying to make good web experiences for anyone but the world's richest users. So if you're serving a lot of work to be done on the client side, on someone else's computer, in general, they're, they're going to have a much worse experience than even you are when testing. We've seen people talk again and again and again about how you should be testing on you know, mid-range Android devices or low-spec Android devices. And there's work in things like the dev tools to help you simulate this kind of environment. And one way to do this, just serve less stuff, right? This is uh, one of the things that's come up before. Um, it's come up in conversations already today. Just put less stuff on the wire. And it's not a bad proxy for reducing your CO2 emissions, for reducing the amount of bandwidth that your users have to use, for reducing the amount of stuff they have to download, for reducing rendering time. Just serve less stuff, and which is convenient because you have an ally in that, which is the network, because the network hates you and would like you to die. So the more you can avoid using the network, which hates you and would like you to suffer, the best. What this is about is availability. Statistic from GDS here in the UK, the Government Digital Service. 1.1% of people aren't getting your JavaScript enhancements. Right? So you think, OK, 1%. But OK, well, you know, we're sad about that. I don't think anyone, certainly no one in this room, but most people in the web development community aren't thinking, yeah, we don't care. We think that's OK, that they deserve to lose. That's a caricature, a straw man, and no one actually thinks that. But I think a lot of people will say, OK, yeah, that 1% of people who aren't getting the stuff, we're sad about that, but, you know, we've got a backlog. And we've got projects to get onto, and we've got a budget. You can't do everybody, right? No one's perfect. We're doing what we can. And you've got to have some level of cutoff, right? Maybe we'll do it next time. But here's the point. It's not like this. So, quoting that GDS report, the proportion of people that have explicitly disabled JavaScript or who use a browser that doesn't support JavaScript only makes up a small slice of the people who don't run JavaScript. This is a um, thing I built, <laughs> sort of a flow chart for uh, reasons that the JavaScript you've got on your page might not run. And there's loads of them. And you wouldn't necessarily expect there to be loads of them. But there are. So before your JavaScript loads, your page is running without JavaScript. Has the HTTP request completed? Does their corporate firewall block JavaScript? And you go, I bet no one does that. Loads of people do that. Are they at an airport? Um, does their ISP, um, Sky, the ISP, block jQuery? For a bit, a few years back, that broke a lot of stuff. Comcast in the US used to insert adverts into people's JavaScript. <laughs> nice. Thanks for that. Um, but yeah, if you're at an airport or you're at, how many of you have had the experience of um, attempting to connect to a website when you're on a hotel Wi-Fi, and then you think, why isn't it connecting? You go, oh, well, I have to go to neverssl.com to make it pop up the login box, or whatever, or I have to switch to Safari on my iPhone to do it. And that happens a lot. Yeah, sure, some of this is about people switching off JavaScript and intentionally doing that. But most of the people who didn't get your JavaScript should have done. This is how it is. It's not 1% of people. When the GDS gave that 1% statistic, it's not 1% of people who always don't get your scripting and 99% who always do. It's 1% of visits which means that the person who didn't get it, the person who got a page where, ideally, if your page was progressively enhanced, it worked perfectly, because the HTML is good and the CSS is good, and if the script isn't there, it's fine. If your stuff isn't like that, if it doesn't work, if the scripting doesn't load, 
then the person who is getting a page which doesn't work is not someone who turned off JavaScript or is browsing with a text mode browser on their VT100 terminal. They are you in a hotel using the Wi-Fi or in a cellar bar or you're on a train just as you've gone into a tunnel. They're not on a WAP phone using a 2G network. And worse, it might actually be like this. Imagine if you go to a website and it doesn't work, and then you go back the next week and it doesn't work again. And imagine you're a normal person, and not us. You might start thinking, this just doesn't work. Maybe I'll use the competition, or I'll use a native application, or I'll just walk away. And then eventually, no one ever comes back. Now, we know better, right? Because we understand the distinction. We understand the technology. So we understand the distinction between the browser failing, the site failing, and the network failing. Right? So how many of you have seen a site not work and just thought, I'll oh, just hit refresh, and then it comes back? Or have toggled your phone into airplane mode and then back out again to make it work on the network? Right? I'm not going to ask people to put their hands up. I've done it. <laughs> but we understand the technology, and it's difficult if you, don't, if you do understand technology, to understand how people who don't understand technology think. Because it's just a weird mystery to most people. This thing didn't work, and I don't get why. And the native app, that always works. Now, this is not true, to be clear. It doesn't always work. But people seem to think that it does. And so what this means is they turn away from the website that you've built and start using your competitor's website, because maybe that's more reliable. Or they start using your native app instead. Or they stop using the web entirely. It feels strange to them because it feels unreliable. Every time your website fails for one person, you marginally decrease the credibility of the web in general. So the fact that the web is not popular, if you build a website that doesn't work without JavaScript, it's literally your fault. Fix it. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the other thing about building for the modern web. It's really hard. <laughs> it's, can you keep up with all of this stuff? I don't think I can. And it's not just me saying this. So um, increasingly, there seems to be a sense of fatigue within our industry. Just when you think you've got a handle on whatever the latest tool or technology is, something new comes out to replace it. From um, uh, Drill on 24 Ways. Anyone recognize a truth in that? <laughs> Owen Williams says, I've discovered how many others have felt similarly, overwhelmed by the choices that we have as modern developers, always feeling like there's something we should be doing better. The web's incredible these days, but I'm not sure that every app needs to be a React-based single-page application because the complexity is so great in a product's infancy. Gary Demon says, SAS and JavaScript dialects and NPM and build tools solve some shortcomings with front-end technology, but at what cost? I'd argue for every hour these new technologies have saved me, they've cost me another hour in troubleshooting or upgrading the tool due to a web of invisible dependencies. In the meantime, I could have broken out any text editor and an FTP program and built a full site with plain HTML and CSS in the time it took me to get it all running, and the site would have been easier to maintain in the long run. More wisdom from Rachel Andrew of this parish. <laughs> I, can, I can still take a complete beginner and teach them to build a simple web page with HTML and CSS in a day. We don't need to talk about tools or frameworks, learn how to make a pull request, drag vast amounts of code onto our computer from NPM to make that start. We just need a text editor and a few hours. This is how we make things show up on a web page. And I'm not trying to overwhelm you with similar quotations. Right? My point is, these are all engaged, smart, educated web developers, web designers, who are invested in the platform and willing to make it great. And they're trying to point out how hard it is. Where did we go wrong? <laughs> and there may be some of you who are thinking, I don't find it difficult. I'm fully on board with this. I get all of this stuff. This is brilliant. I study all this in my spare time, everything. But if it's not you feeling it, that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone around you isn't. 
If you find this stuff easy and you find it fascinating to rechange your tool set once a week, think about the other people in your team or in your office or in your GitHub repo who might be struggling a bit. And think, what are we actually getting from this? Is it, I mean, sure, it's fun. Don't get me wrong, fiddling with new tools is great. <laughs> I really enjoy it. But I don't know that it's making the web better. And it's not even about making it better for us. I don't know that it's making it better for the people who are important, which are the people we're building it for. This is a link. This is not a link. <laughs> this, don't do this. <laughs> Use HTML when you can. When you can't, we'll get to that. <laughs> Why are we doing this? I just asked, what are we getting out of this? Why are we doing this? Let's take a step back. I can do that without falling off the back of the stage. I checked. <laughs> there are reasons. Right? I can stand up here and decry the idea of using JavaScript instead of HTML. Um, and people will say, but you're not being realistic. And yeah, I mean, you've got a point. Don't get me wrong. I agree with you. There are reasons why people have decided to take on software engineering principles, why the web has evolved from being a thing that people did on their laptops for a laugh to an actual industry where we run the universe. Check it out, you know. One day I woke up and everything was the web. It's great. Um, but there are reasons why we've adopted a lot of software engineering principles, a lot of process, a lot of structure. And they are good reasons. We get things like component reuse. We get libraries of existing code we can go back to and pick up and use again. Someone else can write the thing so you don't have to. And more importantly, they can debug it and they can pull in bug fixes from all over the shop and handle use cases that you wouldn't have thought of or wouldn't have come across. This is collaborative software is a good thing. Open source software is a good thing. And getting to reuse this is useful. You get a consistent starting point. If you have a project boilerplate in your company or your project or your organization or whatever, and you always start from the same place, you understand that place. You can build things into that, which is good for things like helping people understand the idea of accessibility, because you can build it into your standard processes from the ground up, rather than expecting someone to come along and sprinkle the magic accessibility waffle dust on the website that you've already built. You can map your organizational structure onto your code structure if you want to. If you have, you are a big company, and you've got lots of separate teams doing lots of separate things, you can have people work on different parts of the site or the service that you're building, and that's much less of a problem than if you just go to everybody, check it out, here's a repository, just edit things. Right? Those of you who used Visual Source Safe back in the day will remember what I'm talking about. <laughs> you can have a list of best practices. You can start to codify, codify some of your institutional knowledge into best practices and list things like design patterns. Not that they're necessarily a great idea, right? <laughs> but turns out design patterns are a terrible idea, and I shouldn't recommend this sort of thing. But, but more importantly, yes, you can have things like pattern libraries, as long as you're not beholden to them. But you can start to inscribe and codify some of your institutional knowledge, some of your tacit knowledge, down into things that you can reuse. But I think these are all after-the-fact justifications. I don't think someone sat down and went, we want all of this stuff. Let's design a world in which you have to download 700 gigabytes of framework stuff from NPM to get it. I think what we did was we built the world of JavaScript first, web development first, and then went looking for reasons why we'd done it. And the reason I think that is because of this. In the old days, when you clicked on a link, your browser page went white. And then the new page loaded. And then when the new page was loaded, it went pink and appeared. So what you got was a, a big white page in the middle. And what that actually represented, that white flag of surrender page, was a loss of control. It was where we, the developer, had to cede control, give up control over what was happening to the browser. And then the browser went away and did things, and it loaded a page or whatever, and then it would, when that page was loaded, it would then give us control back. 
But we didn't get to do anything about that interim, that interregnum between pages. That was just, we were giving it up. And we don't like giving up control. And we are right to not like giving up control. The whole point of being a developer is to have control over the user experience. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to give users a delightful, excellent experience. And the way to do that is not to have someone else do half of it for you. And so giving up control is a bad idea. Click on a link, white page. Now, you don't, that doesn't happen anymore. There's now a thing called paint holding, where when you click on a link, it just shows you the page you've currently got until the next one loads. And that's, it's made things feel snappier, but it's still a loss of control. It's still, you click a link, the browser decides what it wants to do, and then it gives control back to you as the developer. And therefore, people internalized, I don't like giving up control. When a new page loads, we give up control. Therefore, page loads are bad. QED, right? Socrates. <laughs> and if page loads are bad, they have to be avoided. And so you don't like giving up control, and so you want to avoid page loads. And therefore, you find yourself thinking, I know what I'll do. Instead of having the browser load the page for me, I'll fetch it off the I'll XML HTTP request it off the server, be fetch now. I'll fetch it off the server, and then I'll insert it myself. Rather than giving up control to the browser and then getting it back, I'll do it all. I'll just I'll ignore the browser's loading mechanism, do it myself. XML HTTP request, get the content of the page, stick it in, inner HTML it into, into the HTML element. Done. Solve that problem. And then you say, ah, but if I do that, right, I pull down this big block of HTML, but a lot of it's already in the page. Because the sidebar and the navigation header and the footer, and honestly, most of the content is the same. Do you only want to change this bit in the middle? That seems pretty wasteful. If I've got to update all of that, that seems a shame. And then someone says, I know what. Imagine if you had that HTML, and instead of just inner HTMLing it into the page, we, only change, we worked out the difference between the two and only changed the bits that had changed. And so you invent the virtual DOM. Right? And then, because you've done that, because you've now rebuilt loading, and you now pull in the HTML, and then you insert only the bits that have changed into the page, that you've replaced page navigation, but you haven't actually navigated to a new page, which means that the URL hasn't changed. So if someone bookmarks the page or shares a link to their friends or just hits refresh, they won't go back to the new page you're on. They'll go back to the previous one, because that's what the URL is. And so you invent client-side routing. And at that point, you are a framework. <laughs> You have built, for logical reasons, all the way through, a complete JavaScript framework which replaces all the browser's loading stuff. And you did all of this because the flash of no content, that white page of surrender, was bad in 2010. It's a pyramid. Each step built on the previous one. Each step only required because the previous one existed. But it's a pyramid balanced on a really tiny point. Imagine if you could control the page loading experience without giving up control. This is what the shared element transition API is for. And now we do a demo. So this is why I screw it up. <laughs> Especially since I've got to look at this screen while typing on this keyboard. <laughs> Which could be a shut up. <laughs> Getting hassle off of Phil. Right. Oh, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. Ha! Right, so where exactly is my mouse pointer? There we are. So, cut down version of the Pixel Pioneers page. Here is me, we click on me, we navigate to this page here. Bom. Back to the schedule. Perfectly standard page navigation, just switches page to page. No worries. Now here, we'll do something slightly different. You've got to watch because it's quick. But if I click this, it faded. <laughs> but importantly, that fade, that transition, was done by these lines of code, one of which is a comment. <laughs> if I go back, get the fade again. Now, the fade wasn't very quick. Oh, sorry, it was very quick. So what about if I did the fade again, and this time it was really slow, so it took two and a half seconds. 
And what I did to change the speed of that fade, you remember I created the fade with that JavaScript from before? What I did to change the speed of that fade was set the animation duration in CSS, something you already know how to do. Switch back. Again, slow fade back. So I created that transition with those two lines of JavaScript. After that, not going to do any more JavaScript, I promise. Now, the next thing, being able to fade from one thing to another is not particularly exciting, and we'll get on to more stuff that you can do. But one of the things that uh, animation does, if you, if you speak to a motion designer, Gavin's here, um, and quite often you'll have things moving around on a page. So for something like a native app, if you pick something off of a list, you'll quite often animate the list item you picked into being the full page because that gives a sense of continuity. You understand that this thing on here that you clicked on became this page. It doesn't just take away your view and replace it with something else, and then you have to make that connection in your head. It happens for you. This is what animation is for. Right? It's not just blinking stuff. So imagine if we clicked on there, and the little picture moved up. And what I did there was I added one CSS uh, uh, tag. So page transition tag, that's all I did. I'll explain all this in a bit more detail. But that's, that code that you've seen in those little boxes did all of this. I didn't do anything else. It's all dead simple. So if I switch back to, yes, there we go, there, Bosch. So that JavaScript code I mentioned, I call document.create document transition. And then I await transition.start. And what transaction.start actually does is it takes a screenshot of the page, like a Polaroid photograph, and then it just shows that to the user. That's it. It just freezes everything dead. It's like the pause button on a video, right? Everything freezes. Thank you, Dr. Schwarzenegger. This is like a world in which I read this article about someone who did Zoom meetings at 9 o'clock in the morning, come in, we'll put a picture of himself up as his webcam. And then he'd be sitting there in a dressing gown, go and make a cup of tea. Now, if any of my clients were in here, I've never done that. <laughs> but it's, what it's actually like is it's like the stage curtain coming down, you know, the big red curtains on stage. You imagine them coming across, and then you can do whatever you like while the curtains are closed, while the screenshot is showing, you can move around the items on the page, you can navigate to a different page, change things around, delete elements, add new stuff, you know, apply transitions to th apply transforms to things, whatever you want to do, because nothing is visible to user because that screenshot is showing. And then when you're finished, you just say, I'm finished now. And then what you've got is essentially two screenshots, one in front of the other. And then you can transition between them how you like. So the fade, for example, that you saw there, that's just fading the opacity of the one behind, to, uh, of the one in front to zero, and the one behind to one. That's it. You already understand how to do this. It's not some mad, complicated JavaScript API, not some, sorry, um, not some difficult, strange, complicated JavaScript API. It's just CSS. You just get the photo, the screenshot of the screen, is just displayed as a CSS element, a pseudo CSS element, technically. And more importantly, that effect that I showed you with the fade, where it takes the screenshot and then you have the page behind, and it just fades out when I'm finished, I didn't have to write any CSS for that at all. That's the default implementation, is a quick fade. So in order to make that longer, I just set the duration on that animation. And everyone in here who does CSS already knows how to create animations, use keyframes, whatever. It just essentially gives you a set of keyframes for free. And then you can fiddle with it, set the animation duration. Whatever you want to do to change that CSS animation, you can just do. So set the animation duration to 2,500 milliseconds, and then the fade takes longer. That's it. And this is not a cut down example where I only show you the important bits. This is it. This is all there was. So if what you wanted to do instead was to, instead of having the things fade, you wanted a slide from left to right. So you click on a link, and this page slides to one side, and the new page slides in behind it. That's just a CSS transform, right? Just translate x 100% the same way you do it. But this is all you have to do. You do create document transition, and then everything else is just plain CSS that you already understand. Now, the, uh, the image thing, 
This is even cooler. Because what you've got there is a separate element that you also want to transition. So the main page you want to fade or to slide or whatever. And then the images, you've got one image before and one image after. What you want is the first image to animate to be the position of the second. So what you do is you set page transition tag on both of them, just with selectors. Right? The selector there is the first image and the second image by ID. And then you set page transition tag. And it knows you transition one to the other. And that's it. I just declared they're both the same thing. And the default transition you get in CSS out of the box is to animate it by transform. So to change its scale and its x and y positions. So you automatically get things moving from one point on the page to another. And that's all you had to do. It's, I don't have to do anything. It's great. So this is where it is. Shared element transitions. Um, what you've also got there is Jay Archibald's talk on YouTube, which is very, very good, and you should watch it. And he does a good job of explaining it. Unfortunately, now we drew the curtain down, we do have to take a look at the truth. Oh, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Um, it's only in Chrome. It's only in Chrome Dev. <laughs> it's not even in Chrome Stable yet. And at the moment, hugely disappointingly, it only works on single page apps. It being in single page apps is not actually useful because you can do this yourself. It's just harder because you have to deal with all the edge cases. Where this is going to be great is when you're navigating from one page to the next, but you still want to animate elements across that transition, still do a fade, still move the image from one to the other, but you're actually going to a different page. That doesn't work yet. It's going to, and it's always been part of the plan, but they did the SPA version first because it's easier. So. Keep your eye on it, but don't necessarily roll it out in production yet. The beauty of this, though, is that it's a progressive enhancement. If you use this and the browser you're in doesn't support it, what you get is you get the page transition you currently get, i.e. nothing, but it still navigates. You don't break anything by doing this. So you eliminate the idea of giving up control. That goes away. So a lot of the reason why pages became single page apps, because you wanted to handle um, navigating yourself, and you wanted to handle animations and display yourself and turning things on and off, it just goes away. And then when this stuff comes online, it just starts to work. No changes. Most of the time, perhaps, you only want to add some sprinkles of interactivity to an existing page. The majority of websites aren't and don't need to be single page apps. That's not me saying that. That's React saying that. That's a direct quote from the React website. <laughs> it's, they say, React has been designed from the start for gradual adoption, and you can use as little or as much React as you want. Now, so this is these are little view components, right? Not just having a go at React. <laughs> um, so these are little view status indicators. And it's not particularly exciting, but the point is that this is just a plain HTML page in which components are being used. The page itself is not one big, huge component. So the page still loads and still runs exactly as you'd expect. And then if the components don't load, then whatever fallback you have in place, whatever enhancement you have in place still works. But you're not relying on your framework to load before anything happens, which means you avoid all the problems we talked about earlier. HTML is. Smarter than it used to be. I'm particularly guilty of this. People who have been on the web a long time kind of internalize the idea that HTML doesn't do very much. Every, every, every element is just kind of a div, and it doesn't do very much exciting. The, the interactivity was minimal at best. But that's not how it is anymore. Now, I've got a couple of little examples, but um, as evidence, I cite the entirety of Jay's talk earlier, right? All the stuff that he was doing there is all amazing stuff that HTML does, half of which I didn't even know about. I've made loads of notes. Um, so to give you an example, um, so people talk about drop-down lists and how I want better solutions for this, but did you know that um, uh, entries can have drop-down lists now? And they have been able to for ages, but people don't know about this. Just had a data list on there, and then you pick the thing. Huh. OK. <laughs> Um, field sets um, can be disabled and enabled, just um, a single button click, whatever. One of my favorites is CSS scroll snap. So if you, um, oh, hang on, 
Where's the actual thumb wheel? <laughs> but if any of you have ever built a carousel or used a thing to build a carousel, um, what this does is it lets you scroll the thing, but it will always scroll to the top of an image or the bottom of an image. So it always puts it in view. There's never anything in the middle. And that's just a CSS setting. It's not that these things are super revolutionary, not at all. It's that each of them would have required, in the past, a bunch of JavaScript to make it happen. And a reasonable portion of our community sort of internalized the idea that that's how you did things, because you really did have to. In 2008 or 2010 or 2012, you couldn't do most of this stuff with HTML and CSS. You just didn't have the flexibility, didn't have the power, didn't have the, the native elements, the support. But now, we kind of do. I mean, watch Rachel's talk, which will happening in about five minutes for a load more details on that. But honestly, JavaScript used to be the place where all the cool new hotness was happening. It was the thing that you had to keep up with because there were massive changes every day. But now, the place where all the hotness is happening is CSS. You've got people going on about um, Interop 2022 where um, all the browsers are, um, to some extent, competing, but to a large extent, cooperating and collaborating to build amazing new stuff. You've got things coming out every day, right? We went, oh, CSS Grid, OK, now here's loads of things. It's masonry and, it's, ugh, what, seriously, Rachel's talk. <laughs> but, and this is important, I'm not saying to not use JavaScript. This is Anna Tudor. And she says, just because you don't understand a simple little CSS solution, it doesn't mean it's weird. And it goes the other way as well. Adding a ton of extra elements just for the sake of having a pure CSS solution when updating the value from the JS would suffice is just silly, which it is. I'm not saying don't use JavaScript. It's the programming language of the web. I, I've written books about it. I love it. JS is my, well, it's either my favorite language or Python is, depends what day it is. But I love it. Use JavaScript for stuff. Just don't let it run everything. It should be a tool you reach for. It shouldn't be the only tool or probably even the first tool that you reach for. Stay in touch with what our industry does. We're in a very fast moving industry. A lot changes. And it is difficult to stay in touch, but it is also important to at least attempt to stay in touch. But stay in touch with all of the tools of the job. All the things relevant to the job. HTML and CSS and JavaScript. Or, don't. Flacky says not knowing stuff is normal. Not using new and shiny tech is OK. Feeling bad for all of them is common, but you are not alone. Don't fight against the web. There's so much in our industry and in the world that needs fighting against. So many ways we need to stand in solidarity with one another as the web development community, with our users as the people we're trying to serve, with the world who need our help. So many ways we can be together on this. There are things which need fighting. The web is not one of them. Don't fight against the web. Work with it. The great thing about standards is there are so many of them. Right? Um, building frameworks, building um, extra components, going beyond what the platform provides is a great idea. You do need that. Um, part of the reason that things take a long time to show up in the web is because the web standards community have to take a long time to standardize things because there's so much that needs thinking about which tends to get glossed over. How does this react? How does this work? Oh. <laughs> How does this thing work with right to left text? How does it work in the accessibility tree? How does it work if, uh, if, you're, if you are going through a screen reader? What how do all of these new things get standardized in all the edge cases that you might not have thought of? Do they work fine on slow connections? What are the perform what's the performance like? What does the JavaScript API look like? What does the HTML API look like? How does this fall back to older browsers? And sure, if you're building something for today, for your site, and you understand your use cases, and you understand your users, and you understand the browsers they're using, maybe you don't need to think about that. So that stuff does take a while when it becomes part of the web itself. So there is a space in there to innovate, to do things the, the platform doesn't currently support. So use extra stuff if you need to. if it's not in the platform. But if you're always doing that, if your justification is always, we're doing stuff that's ahead of the platform, we're that innovative that everything we're doing can't be supported by the platform because we're just that far ahead, 
You're always on the bleeding edge? I mean, really? To build a login form? <laughs> it's valuable what we do as an industry. We have the power to bring knowledge to the whole world, connect people together when that's what they want. We have the power to be the greatest repository of information that's ever been known. That's what the web is for. That's why we're building it. Let's keep it that way, all of us. Thank you very much. <laughs>